Um, so we have a lot to cover today. We have to basically finish the rest of artificial intelligence. So we're going to have to <laughs> kind of, yeah. So in, in service of that, I have like 300 slides at this point, and we're going to look at all of them. Um, <laughs> 200 of them or so you've already seen. Uh, we're just going to do like a review. I kind of like this repetition thing. Um, and um, this is a joke because really, you know, we've obviously um, kind of prioritized uh, the breadth of this field. That's because um, I think it's, it's uh, important for people to kind of have a compass as to where things are, where things stand. And um, because when you see the big picture, then when you start to go back and fill in the, the part, the details of it, it starts to become more clear. And I think that's how at least it's worked for me. And I suspect it works like that for a lot of people. Um, like we've gone through a lot of things quickly and so a lot of times some of the details probably have been very evasive um, but for me I find that when I kind of constantly repeat things and go through the same materials over and over when I know what happened at the end the details of it kind of become a little more more obvious to me so um, that's why we're going to actually the first thing we'll do today is the, we're gonna recap the entire class and then we'll move into some new material um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think that kind of gives us a nice summary of what we've seen uh, and also um, maybe some of those details will become a little more, more clear to people. Um, and uh, okay, so this is a bit snarky, but um, what I mean to say is, so this whole I don't care about your grades thing. So grades, are, um, really I think like every, everyone here knows what they've gotten out of the class. So some, for some people it's been maybe too fast, or for some people it's been too slow, or for some people it's been just right. Uh, and so to assign a grade is kind of, I think, superfluous. Like everyone knows what they've gotten out of it. Really, you should be giving me a grade, which is to say like, what, what could have, how could have this class been structured differently so that it would have been more befitting for you? Um, so you might have noticed that I haven't like taken attendance or, uh, or graded assignments or anything like that because, um, because of this this whole notion. Uh, but I do care about you, as you can, as you can tell. Um, so in, uh, for that reason, I'm actually um, looking into the idea of unofficially extending the class just a little bit. Uh, and, uh, and I've talked to a couple of you about that. Um, because uh, obviously this class has been very quick and we've been working uh, for, towards these presentations. But it's probably going to be that most people's ideas are, you know, maybe kind of germinating right now. They're like halfway done. And um, what I propose to do, and I, I don't know, this is kind of like a wild guess. I don't know if people, I don't know if everyone will be interested in doing this or not. Um, but, but I have um, clearance to kind of use the School for Poetic Computation space um, to have a few more of these sessions, which would probably be more kind of workshoppy rather than lecture based. So, um, and I don't even know if most people would be able to make it, but I, I wanna look into um, people's schedules and see what, if there's any interest. And part of the reason why this might be nice is um, if you're kind of working for some, uh, working on some application and you wanna develop it uh, further, there's actually going to be some opportunities to do things with it. So one is I know that there's the, um, there's the ITP show here, right, I guess a couple weeks from now. And also uh, there will be an exhibition for uh, AI stuff at SFPC, which I am organizing, um, which is to say that it's a good opportunity to kind of maybe put all of the, you know, there's a lot of aligned interests and maybe people might be interested in developing stuff for that because we're going to have a big gallery of machine learning works and, it, and uh, there will be lots and lots of different works. Um, and so, yeah, that's something to put out there. Maybe some people will be interested in, uh, maybe other people will be ready to call it call it a class next week, um, and that's totally fair. Um, and uh, yeah, so just to talk a little bit about the presentations for next week, uh, so just bring in sort of what you have. And some people might have a, a prototype, other people might have an idea, other people might have done some research into some interesting, uh, some of the like more sociological issues that we brought up over the course of the term. So those might be, those might also make for, uh, yeah, that, so basically for presentations, just kind of start a conversation about something that interests you. You can show uh, something that you're working on, or you can, or you can talk about some element of the class that, that maybe we didn't cover in very much depth. 
And that's kind of how we'll look at presentations. You, you can go for as little time as you want, um, and, but then, but as far as the maximum amount of time, we'll just basically divide the total amount of class time by the number of, of people, and then that'll be the maximum. Um, and then for those people who are interested in doing these unofficial sessions, that's an opportunity to kind of maybe just for next week, um, just to show us an idea and get a conversation started with, with me and with your peers also. And then maybe we can guide that toward over the next few weeks to something that you can, that you can work on over these workshops. Um, and so yeah, you can if effectively do, you can effectively transfer this by a couple weeks to SFPC. <laughs> um, and I want to, I'm going to do this more formally with like a, a Google poll or something like that to get people's availabilities. But as a first try, I wanted to ask, uh, are people in general next week at this, uh, or sorry, two weeks from now, after the class is over, at this time, are people still in the city or are they free? Is there anyone uh, um, who's not here anymore? I think so. Yeah, two weeks from now, we're doing the... We'll have the whole week with Jesus' presentation. Right, right, right. Which, oh, which means you'll be here, like... The is actually uh, closed. I mean, from oh, 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 but it, well, not, not here though, just in general if you're free. Oh, right. Well, Second years have pieces, maybe first years, but would it be during the day or evening? Well, that's kind of a, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, we can take a poll and see. Uh, personally, I'm, I have a, and also we have to look at SFPC's availability, not all, all the times are unoccupied already, but... Um, I'll just try to, for the people who are interested, I'll have a Google poll. We can see what times people are available. I think it's going to be not possible to book even uh, rooms during this. Yeah. And that, it's not going to be here. Yeah. It won't be here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Then I'll move this conversation offline, basically, um, so we have some time to figure it out. Um, okay. So I think we can kind of start getting into the material. Uh, just a couple other quick things. So in the last um, lecture video, I attached some uh, terminal.com instructions for how to, you, how to generate text and how to do the neural style transfer. Um, so that's out there. That's ready for people to use. It's, uh, and we have a lot of free credit. So if you don't use it, I will. Um, so you should try to, for those of you who are interested in doing some style transfers um, or torcharnen, um, please um, take advantage of it because we have these instructions and, and I hope they're pretty clear. If you have any questions about it, just let me know. Um, so keep, um, yeah, if, if that's something people want to use. Uh, does, are there any questions about those? Has anyone tried to use those? Okay, it's been pretty busy. Okay. Is it all CPU? Uh, it is all CPU, unfortunately, yeah. But, but for the text generation, it actually doesn't make a huge difference. Maybe it takes twice as long or something to train. For style transferring, it's a pretty big difference. So it takes like an hour to make one image, which is pretty painful. Um, but um, but there's in the video, there's a few tips that I give that would make it easy to prototype by kind of taking some shortcuts, maybe doing fewer iterations to get a sense of what it's going to look like because it's a generative model. So like um, over time, the pixels kind of um, approach, they converge onto something. Um, and then using, making, using smaller tiles is also a helpful way to kind of prototype and see, see what it's going to look like. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's easy enough to make one and it's kind of nice, nice thing to have. Um, okay, there's this one article that I wanted to share about, uh, and I actually didn't, didn't watch this, it just came out this week. So, uh, but, but it's gotten a lot of, um, a lot of people think a lot of people in my network kind of think this is interesting. So it's about uh, basically how some AI systems essentially amplify privilege or power in in society, which is to say that like some of the automated systems we have, it's looking at bias in automated systems, and some of the findings that they have is that like people who are in privileged positions um, and different like so, sort of socioeconomic statuses. This tends to reinforce their uh, reinforce their views online in sort of content uh, aggregation systems. Um, so this is kind of a video. I'm going to include a link to this in the um, in the notes. So if people are interested in following up on this, it might be a nice nice thing to to watch. Okay, let's get into the slides. So let me just tell you basically what we're going to talk about today. 
Um, first of all, we're going to do the whole class again in 10 minutes. I think 10 minutes, maybe it'll be like 15 minutes. Uh, and the whole idea of this, I have this, this notion that like repetition is a sort of mental backpropagation. So like we talked about training networks where you know you constantly give it data and it goes forward and backward through the data. And we saw this very explicitly with like text, the text generating system. So it kind of goes through these epics where it keeps on combing the same text over and over. And I find that this kind of trains the neurons to really understand what's going on a little better. So we're going to do another comb through. Um, and again, and also just like we, we did last week, I'll focus on the elements of it that are going to be useful for us today uh, because we're going to talk about almost completely different stuff today, um, which, um, which is kind of maybe annoying but also exciting. So um, what we are going to talk about, the new stuff we're going to get into, is this stuff. So we're going to talk about what are called generative models. And um, this sounds like a very... Um, like generic word for something and you might think of style transfer and deep dream as having been generative and they are in some sense of the word but what we're going to see is we're going to talk about different kinds of neural networks and architectures which uh, produce produce images mostly um, but rather than being sort of um, rather than having neural networks be a, a sort of analytical tool at the side which is used in some optimization process to make an image like style transfer and deep dream are, we're going to see neural networks which literally produce the images themselves, like as their output. And that's kind of what generative models are. And it has a more generic, has a, a more a general um, definition as well, which I'll, which I'll talk about when we get into them. So we'll talk about autoencoders, um, which are, um, which follow very closely from, um, the kind of uh, stuff that we've seen so far in feed-forward neural networks. And then we'll talk about generative adversarial networks, which is an architecture which makes use of uh, neural networks, including one which actually produces images. And I'll show you some, um, some actual projects from in practice. Um, we looked at these briefly in the first day, so that was part of the introductory slides. So um, today we'll, we'll actually talk about what they are a little bit more. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about this. Um, we'll talk about reinforcement learning. So on the first day, um, I introduced the three branches of machine learning. And so far, we've talked about two of them, supervised and unsupervised learning. Today, we'll talk about the third branch of machine learning. And you'll see why it's a third branch in and of itself. Because the, the very initial problem statement that it makes is totally different from what we've seen so far. Uh, but reinforcement learning is super interesting and um, super relevant also. Uh, because we've seen we've had some major advances this year in particular in reinforcement learning uh, and we're going to talk about some of them um, so we'll talk about and the, the cool thing about reinforcement learning is that um, we'll talk about some of the applications but the main application that I want to talk about is um, AlphaGo um, which was the um, system by Google's DeepMind group which uh, defeated the top human player at the game of Go so we'll talk about chess playing AI, Go playing AI Go playing AI and um, AIs which play video games in general. So we're going to talk a lot about video games today. Um, so that should be pretty fun. Uh, yeah, and then maybe I wrote some notes about sort of history and uh, or sort of future and um, some pointers about how to continue. But we'll get to that. Um, does anyone have any questions? Cool. All right. The cool thing, the reason why I'm, I'm particularly excited about the AlphaGo, I, I kind of think it's, it's a, um, a very fitting way to end officially the official lectures of the class because we'll see with AlphaGo, it really, really like makes use of uh, a lot of the things that we've learned so far in class uh, as a sort of ensemble, like a big architecture which makes use of a lot of the things that we've seen. Um, and it's a very, very recent uh, very recent triumph in machine learning uh, and AI that we've that, that was really just kind of came to a forefront last month uh, and so it's um, kind of the cherry on top of the class let's 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 think of it that way um, okay so let's review everything that we've seen so far uh, and I'm just going to go through the slides quickly we're not going to go into this stuff in depth I just just want to just want to highlight the salient points of what we've done so far so machine learning we've Traditionally is three branches. There's, there's um, su supervised and unsupervised learning. So these two things right here are actually um, what, what 
all of this here, um, or the top half here, is what, what you would call supervised learning, which is you have this, this, you have this set of data, and you want to learn from it either how it corresponds to some class label or to some continuous value. So we're kind of mapping an x to a y. That's what supervised learning is. And unsupervised learning, there's no y. There's just data, and we're interested in um, making, uh, organizing it or characterizing it or deriving um, interesting properties from it and so on. And we've been using these two... Um, especially when, with the applications of convolutional neural networks that we've seen, we've kind of used them together. And so sometimes the distinction between them is um, a little blurry. The third branch of machine learning, which we'll talk about later, is called reinforcement learning. And I'll, and I'll define that more clearly when we, when we get to it. Um, so we spent really the basic, most of the um, course talking about neural networks and different kinds of neural networks. And um, they're loosely inspired by the brain and neurons as information processing units. Although by now, the, uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, distance between neural networks research and actual research into brains. Um, we kind of use them as a loose analogy, and sometimes it's useful, and sometimes it will just annoy cognitive scientists and neuroscientists. So um, kind of use them. <laughs> use them accordingly. Uh, we saw how, um, we saw, I talked a little bit about their history, and there's a nice quote from Ada Lovelace describing something akin to neural networks uh, 100 years before we kind of formally derived them. Um, neural networks were behind the first big boom of AI, so in the 1960s, this is, I dug this up from the New York Times, uh, 1958, when um, sort of the first uh, successful use of a neural network was um, something called a perceptron, which is this type of neural network which, is, which works only on binary units, and, they, um, and it was demonstrated by the Navy in some application. Uh, and it was like a huge, it was a gigantic device that was like the size of, of a submarine, and it had maybe like a couple hundred neurons in it or something. Um, so we've come a really long way. And this is kind of the... Uh, some of the uses that we've seen of neural networks. So you can load up a neural network uh, with raw, and, and this is really the, this is when we get into deep neural networks. So what we've found is that we can input raw data, you know, whether they're pixels or audio or text, we can input those raw features directly into a neural network and have it learn in an unsupervised manner the different sort of hierarchical levels of features that are useful for making classifications or predictions and so on. And um, this is kind of contrasted to how we used to do things, which would, which would use a lot more sort of expert, um, what we called handcrafted features, and which characterized machine learning for much of the sort of 90s and 2000s. Um, we talked about, and we, we're not going to look at the demos today, but we talked about um, classification, uh, and it, we use this, um, this demo of classifying handwritten digits. Uh, we talked about how the weights have meaning. So in a one-layer neural network, you can visualize the weights, and they form these sort of class templates because what they're trying to do is come up with a, in a, um, a weight matrix which is very sympathetic to the kinds of images that that neuron is, is assigned to classify. And so we get these kinds of patterns. Um, we talked about Wekinator for about a week and a half, and all the different things you could do with it. And when we talked about Wekinator in particular, it was it was it kind of broke some of the assumptions already that we had been working with. This notion of like a predictive interpretation of neural networks, we could we could use it in a different way. Because when we're mapping x to y, that can mean any that can mean other things to us. It could be an association of one medium to another medium that we happen to find desirable for some performance scenario or something like that. So that started to kind of open up this, this, um, this view of neural networks as this uh, device for mapping one high-dimensional space into another high, potentially high-dimensional space. Uh, then we got into, we spent a good solid two weeks on convolutional neural networks which uh, improve neural networks uh, by addressing some of the limitations they have and the difficulties they have in um, how to deal with uh, different kinds of image, image classes or, or data which 
uh, have all sorts of variations which are difficult to account for with normal neural networks. So they might have uh, different sort of stretches or reorientations or clutter, um, or they might be located in different parts of the image and so on. Those are all uh, limitations that neural networks struggle to overcome. And with convolutional neural, neural networks, we saw that we could actually do a pretty good job, um, job with those. Um, and, and convolutional neural networks essentially do this. So they have this, um, uh, they introduce two new kinds of layers. One is a uh, convolutional layer, which does the following. So it's a set of filters, which are slid across the image at every point. And then it gives us a particular response, which is the result of this dot product of multiplying the filter by the subset of the image. And uh, the different weights will give us different responses. And what we could do is, oh, and then there's pooling, which is just downsampling, right? So pooling is a pretty simple operation. Uh, and it's really the convolutions that, that have the most value. And what we saw that we could do with, um, with these convolutional layers is we can create these compositional, um, th that we can train neural networks to become sort of these compositional, um, hierarchical compositional algorithms. So in the first layer, we interpret these as sort of just edge detectors and finding um, different, I kind of like the way the uh, stripes look on this, right? It, like you really see the stripes come out in these responses. Anyway, that's interesting. Uh, in any case, um, so the interpretation of these is that as we go down the layer, we acquire more and more abstract features. And we also reduce the amount of information. So we kind of pixelize these more and more until we have a, a set of these very high level um, neurons, these pixels, which denote the presence or absence of a particular feature. And then at the end, we tie them into a fully connected layer, which is like the kind that we saw in ordinary neural networks, and then another one in this particular architecture, and then that finally goes to classifications. And then what we understand is that this um, set of neurons in the last, the second to last layer is very valuable. It has all the, it has this very high layer, uh, sorry, high level, almost semantic meaning to it. So it's abstract, it, it's, it has be become, uh, the network has been trained to make each of these neurons pick up some high-level feature which is valuable to it or important for um, important for making these classifications well. So, you know, if you look at some of these classes, you know, I'll, I'll just pick out a random one, stethoscope, you know, so one of these, it looks, thinks I'm a stethoscope. So a stethoscope might be made up of like um, a tube or, you know, and, um, or like two tubes and the like earpieces and a little dial. So there might be, uh, in previous layers, there might be neurons which are responding highly for those things. And then the stethoscope classification responds when we have um, a high activation for those previous uh, elements, if that makes sense. It doesn't even make sense to me sometimes, so don't worry if it... <laughs> uh, let's skip some of these demos. So we talked about um, different ways of analyzing neural networks and looking to see what sorts of mistakes they make and analyzing their behavior and, and evaluating it. And then we started talking about how the activations themselves have meaning. We can probe them to see, for example, wh where, uh, like what parts of the original images uh, cr uh, made certain neurons have a high response. And so you can check this at every layer and then look for what part of the original image caused this response to be high or the highest. Uh, and we talked about how you could use deconvolution to get this sort of, um, uh, to get a representation of the, um, uh, of the image which shows us which, which pixels are uh, contributing to this activation and therefore what is it, um, like uh, what is the essence of this class? What's it picking up on basically? Uh, we talked about these occlusion experiments that uh, showed us that you can, um, well, the occlusion experiments would be like, as you move, as you occlude different parts of an image, how does that affect the activations? And in particular, how does it affect the final layer, the classification? Um, so, for example, with this Pomeranian, if you occlude its face, the classification of a Pomeranian goes down, which shouldn't be surprising. And that tells us something about 
this part, this, this part of the image tells us that it's very important to classifying the thing as a Pomeranian. Uh, we... <sighs> this <laughs> I have bugs in my slideshow. Uh, it doesn't always break. I don't know why, that, why it broke that time. Uh, all right, let me just skip the occlusion demo real quick because we have already, that's the one that's breaking, so I'm just gonna, just gonna get rid of that. Okay, back to our, okay. Uh, these are just some more experiments that were done um, by people working on different ways of visualizing. So these are like reconstructions um, using, uh, uh, using something called guided backpropagation, which gives us sort of higher quality visualizations. We talked about Deep Dream and um, how Google's neural networks are trained for um, recognizing images to be of certain things like ants or starfish or parachutes and so on. And then you could do these experiments where you try to produce an image using some optimization process which evolves each of its pixels so that it um, comes to, uh, so that it, it, it receives a very high activation in some neuron of interest. So for example, for the classification of ants, this image, when you pipe it through this CubeNet, it will, it will give the ants activation, it will make the ants activation very high uh, and the other ones would be very low. So we kind of talked about these approaches to synthesizing images and talked about the different things that you can do with, with uh, the, the really cool, interesting visual experiments that you could do with Deep Dream. Um, so these are just some examples. You can choose to enhance high layers or low layers and apply it to different sorts of images, photographs, paintings, vacation photos, and so on. Da Vinci. Uh, we talked about how to uh, make videos so you can kind of, and this is sort of a trick that Mike Tyka developed where you can kind of repeatedly crop an image and then deep dream it again uh, and then just do this forever and get some really wild effects out of it. Uh, we talked about uh, in the class visualization, so again this is more along the lines of the, um, the ones that we saw when we introduced Inceptionism. So here you see that we can um, we can look at the classes that are part of Google's Inceptionism network, and this is just mostly animals and things like that. Uh, and, um, and using different techniques to bring these out. We talked about more class visualization. Uh, we talked about style transfer and how you can, and the way style transfer differs from Deep Dream is that now we have two images, and one we assign it to be the content image, and the other one is the style image. <clears throat> and uh, the, the image, the output image, is the result of this optimization process, much like Deep Dream is also the result of an optimization process, um, which instantiates an image, which is usually just white noise, just random pixels, and then it evolves those pixels iteratively um, <clears throat> by trying to minimize this, uh, and this is the original paper for it, uh, and we talked a little bit about the theory, but the main equation is, is this, right? So we're trying to sort of have a low style loss and a low content loss. And the content loss is the difference, the, like a Euclidean distance in the activations of the content image and the activations of the output image. So even though this looks kind of complicated, it, it, it's actually saying something really simple. It's just those pixels, those raw, uh, the pixels in the demo that we saw. You can take one image, pipe it through, and then make, uh, that's the content image, and then you can pipe the output image through the same network, observe their activations, and if they have similar activations, they should have similar content. And so their con the difference between their content uh, vectors will be very small. So that's the content loss. The style loss is a little co more complicated, but it's also a function of the activations, except for there's an extra step where we take this gram matrix and what the gram matrix is, is it's, a correl it's the correlation between every pair of activations at every layer. Um, the paper is actually very lucid, so if you're interested in this process, I would, I would read um, the, the original paper. 
And then at the, the final loss, we're just kind of balancing these two because they might be in mutual conflict with each other. Uh, then we looked at a whole bunch of different things you could do with style transfer, lots of eye candy. Um, <clears throat> we talked about, well, I made a lot of these. We could do a video. Um, we can do HD. Um, and also we talked, like, there's different, well, this is also in the terminal demo, I get into a little bit more of the details of how these are made and different options. So for example, one of them, th this video you're looking at, instead of using a white noise image, it actually starts from the content. So that's just uh, some different free parameters that you could play with. Uh, more videos, um, interpolations, feedback, processes. Uh, what happens if you get rid of the content loss? So now we just have a style loss, and so now we're just pr producing machine hallucinated junk. <laughs> Uh, we're going to make more of this machine hallucinated junk today. We talked about TSNI. TSNI is a dimensionality reduction algorithm, and we can use the activations from a, a convolutional neural network, which characterize these images at a very high level. If we apply TSNI to it, we can um, create these sort of... Uh, we, can, we can visualize pictures that are very similar to each other being grouped together. And then this is just an animation that shows TSNI, the, the actual process, uh, because it works in over iterations, and it's also the result of a, an optimization process, which is um, solved by uh, backpropagation using stochastic gradient descent, which we haven't really talked about at all. Um, just one of the things that has fallen by the wayside, uh, but that's, that's maybe for part two. Um, so we combine TSNI with the gridding algorithms, which will take the sort of unordered 2D TSNI and assign it to a grid, either in 2D or 3D. <clears throat> and you could do it with images, right? So this is grouping uh, similar images together uh, from different data sets. This is just a bunch of flowers. Um, Ikea items, I think this one's my favorite. <clears throat> um, street view images from Bogota or, or New York. Um, we got impressionism, pa impressionist paintings, satellite imagery, uh, and 10,000 grocery store items. And then this one I just did recently, which, which is the entire Caltech 256 data set, which is huge. Somewhere in, the, in here, and I can't remember where, there's a cluster of uh, images of Jesus, Buddha, and uh, unicorns. So that's the Jesus, Buddha, unicorn cluster. I think it's somewhere in the top left quadrant. I'll have to... Did you, did you see it? I think it's, yeah, it's like, there's Buddhas and you're just under where your mouse is. Just under where the mouse is? Let's zoom in. You're over it. Down a little bit? I still don't... Down? Oh, oh, there it is, yes. Hooray, there it is. Oh, it's very low res. I think I, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with this. Okay, so here's our unicorn Jesus Buddha cluster. Great. <laughs> um, you can apply TSNI to other kinds of data. So this is it applied to text. So you can take a bunch of articles, like these Wikipedia articles about political philosophies, and you can arrange them uh, in a TSNI by analyzing the text inside them, uh, either using like, like a word counting approach, like TFIDF, or uh, there's other ways of doing it. So like Leighton, uh, Leighton Dirichlet allocation, that's like another... Um, popular method for analyzing text and sort of grouping it into topics. Um, it's a sort of dimensionality reduction for, for text. Um, one thing that we didn't really talk about is word to vec which um, maybe that's something we'll talk about in, in one of the SFPC workshops. I don't think we'll have time for it today. Um, but um, word to vec is super interesting. Uh, but we'll, we'll skip that for now. Okay, so we talked about recurrent neural networks, and we're actually, uh, that was sort of a one-week aside. We're not really going to talk about RNNs today. Uh, but recurrent neural networks were really where we took architecture to the next level. So we were able to uh, figure out a way to um, uh, use neural networks in tandem with sequences of data, and sequences that are not fixed in length. And that's really important because it allows us to uh, work with things whose sizes we don't know in advance, uh, and also work with things that change over time. So that's kind of the, the difference between recurrent neural networks and, fee and feed-forward neural networks. Feed-forward neural networks, just as a reminder of terminology, that's, uh, those are networks where information starts at the first layer, 
goes through a series of, it, it never returns, it never loops back in itself, it doesn't stay in the system. It just kind of goes from left to right. So that's both the ordinary fully connected neural networks that we saw and uh, convolutional neural networks. And RNNs uh, break the structure in a very clever way. Um, we, uh, we talked about how these are structured. So the, the main way that this is done is that, that a, a recurrent neural network has a hidden state. And then the hidden state is updated every time we pass data through it. And then there's a previ the previous hidden state is stored. So after every forward pass, this h of t becomes h of t minus 1. So like the, it becomes the, the previous time step. Um, and then this allows the internal state of the RNN to evolve one uh, forward pass at a time and allows us to train it, uh, therefore, on sequences of data. And we kind of see this structured approach where um, at every time step, the, the, the internals of the recurrent neural network, the hidden state, is a function of the previous hidden state and the input that's going into it and, the, and, um, and so on. And we talked about how we can apply this to text so we can set, we can take a big text of, of um, like a big text of something, uh, take all the characters and uh, input them into the recurrent neural network in this in sequence in a sequence of characters, and then have it try to predict the next character in the sequence so that the outputs here, the targets, are just offset the inputs offset by one. So this is H to E, E to L, L to L. And then you, then you train it as we would any other recurrent neural network, right? Each, each of these you can think of as a sample. And then we try to um, get this, uh, the internals of the, the weights of the recurrent neural network such that it's able to effectively predict all of these. Uh, and then once you do that, you can apply a sampling process to generate text. And the sampling process means, you know, you, you pipe a character into the network, it gives you a probability distribution over what it thinks the next character in the sequence would be. You sample according to that distribution to get the second character, and then you put it right back into the network and then get the next character, and so on. And we saw that this can be, uh, these are LSTMs. We didn't really talk about um, the difference, but we, we kind of use them interchangeably. So LSTMs uh, improve recurrent neural networks by introducing this concept of sort of internal memory. Um, which it accomplishes through these these um, sort of input, output, and forget gates. Uh, the internals of this are a little complex, so uh, if you are interested in it, there's there's a there's a lot of very lucid writing that we'll talk about this in a little more detail. But we saw how LSTMs can be used to create text. So this is Shakespeare or like various fake Shakespeare, um, XML. We saw that it has very good contextual knowledge, so it knows how to uh, close page tags in XML. Um, it, it can generate very, uh, very real-looking code with for loops and if statements and fake comments and so on. Um, and it makes LaTeX, so that's math papers. So anything that can be represented as text can be put through uh, a recurrent neural network trained in characters. It makes these fake, fake uh, diagrams. We saw recipes. Uh, we saw uh, Donald Trump Twitter accounts. Um, and um, all the funny things that you can say with them. This is my Gmail. Uh, different languages. You can um, make emo you can take like um, vector graphics, which are just text. So these are emojis that were made by Kyle. Um, and um, Mario levels. Anything that can be represented as a sequence can be piped through a recurrent neural network. So this is, and we'll, we'll talk about Mario more uh, in just a little bit. Um, and actually, this was just two days ago. So this this um, author, Robin Sloan, I don't know if some of you guys have heard of him, um, uh, but he uh, put this on Twitter like two days ago, where he he's making a a sort of science fiction writing assistant. So you can see what's going on here is that he types, and then he asks the recurrent neural network to to give him a few candidates. So he'll seed, you know, he goes, he seeds it with the computer said, and then it gives it gives him some text like "keep out of the way, Jenny." Uh, so this is kind of a, and this is neat. This is this shows us um, like different things that we can do with a recurrent neural network that's training trained to predict text. Maybe we can think of like different ways of um, writing short stories in collaboration with, with uh, machines. Um, so this would be, this is super interesting. In fact, I think it's so interesting that people might, might find some ideas for a project.
Um, yeah, I, th I like this writing writer's assistant idea. Uh, we talked about different architectures of recurrent neural networks that you can use for language translation um, or just in general sequence to sequence. Uh, you could do unit to sequence, so this is image captioning. So this is like we X is just an image and it conditions the recurrent neural network in a certain way to go into that part of its hidden the, the its hidden state that is likely to predict the words that are associated with that image. Um, so uh, you can generate captions from images. You can, um, yeah, more captioning. You can do it on subsets of the image. Um, so you can do, this is called dense captioning. Um, and uh, you can, yeah, then which is combined with this sort of localization approach, which proposes for the recurrent neural network different subsets of the image that it thinks might have some semantic meaning. And, and then it tries to jointly optimize both the recurrent neural network and the and um, the, lo the localization layer that's coming from the, the CubeNet. Um, semantic object parsing, handwriting, LSTMs, just tons and tons of different applications. Um, sequence to unit, which can be used for generating images from captions, so the reverse process. And we talked about how this indicates that in the future maybe we'll have these systems which are exchanging information using machine learning across media. You know, so you go text to image and then in some other component it goes image to text. Uh, and then maybe it comes back around and reinforces the original system. Um, so that's kind of like, um, yeah, that's very, very abstract, very speculative, but, but, but this kind of is hinting towards a future where we can do that. Um, visual attention, so this is actually a fixed input, which is processed sequentially, so that's just another way we can think of recurrent neural networks as being useful. Um, the reverse process, so generating images, and we'll actually talk a little bit about one of the aspects of this. Uh, when we get into generative models. Sequence to sequence, um, I didn't show this project before when we talked about recurrent neural networks, but um, this, um, this guy on Twitter, uh, just known as Hard Hardmaru, um, he has this blog where he, um, one, of the, one of the things that he did is um, he, you, he trained a recurrent neural network to produce fake, fake kanji. So he wrote in this blog post about how like, um, He's, he's of Japanese, uh, Japanese descent, and he talked about how horrible it is. Like, as a kid, he'd have to learn Chinese characters. And uh, that was just what he wrote, what he wrote, yeah. He's, he's like, because he, cause he grew up in, in, I think, in America. Uh, but anyway, he uh, trained a net network on, um, on SVG files of, of, um, of, of Chinese characters to, gener to generate fake ones. So these, you know, if you try to re read them, they're not going to make any sense, right? Um, but um, but they're pretty neat to look at. Um, okay, so that was the whole class in 10, was that 10 minutes? Maybe it was like 20 minutes? <laughs> Let's uh, see, 4.15, 4.15, okay. Oh, we are way behind schedule, okay. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> All right, so um, the next thing we're gonna talk about today, and we haven't seen these yet, are what, uh, and uh, we're going to talk about two things, autoencoders and um, generative adversarial networks, and they're both types of what we call generative models. And what we mean by generative model in this context, in, in, the, in like a more generic, more generic um, definition for generative models is it's any model which basically learns, takes some, some input space of, of data, and it learns a model which is able to generate samples of that, of that data com that, that look real, basically. Um, so in the context of neural networks, it looks like, like this. Um, so if you look at the bottom half of this, this is a neural network in which the input layer is structured exactly like the output layer. And what we do is, in our experiment, we might have some data set. Let's, let's suppose it's of images, of numbers or something. Uh, what we'll do is we'll um, send our images into the input layer and we, what we want the network to do is to reconstruct the input at the output layer. So we want the outputs to be exactly what the inputs are and that's our training. So in training we'll put in our entire data set and we will try to optimize it so that it learns this internal, this internal set of weights which will map the input to the output exactly. 
Um, in other words, it's the this is kind of a joke. It's the world's most expensive identity function. So it's like a really really complicated way of multiplying by one, right? Um, and and so you might be thinking like, well, why would we do that? It doesn't seem very useful. And we'll see that it's actually useful for for a variety of reasons. Um, but a more abstract way of of looking at this is kind of from here, right? We we start with an input x, and we um, we will go through some transform transformation process, which uh, ends up at x prime. And x prime is supposed to equal to be equal to x. Uh, it's not going to be because we can't we can't optimize it perfectly. But our goal is for x and and x prime to be the same. What is z? Sorry. What is z? I, I'm getting to that. So um, z in the context of neural network will be will be this. Um, suppose we might assign it to be like the middle layer. Right? So Z might be the, just these three neurons. And if you do this, then the interpretation, let's see if the, okay, actually I'll just I'll stick with the side, side. The interpretation, this is what's called an autoencoder. And the interpretation is this. We're kind of creating a framework for uh, deriving a very compact generative representation of the data. And the, the reason why it's like that is, is um, remember that in a, in a feed-forward uh, feed neural network, every time we go from one layer to the next, it's, uh, that layer is simply a function of the previous layer. And all of the layers be behind it, it, they don't matter anymore. So like once we have that, once we've propagated to, let's say, this, this third layer, we have these values. We can forget everything that's here. We can just discard it. And we can go directly from here to the output. So suppose that we have um, trained an autoencoder in this fashion. Then the network is such that I, I can take an image of a two, let's say, and it'll go through the neural network and it will create a reconstructed version of this two. And it will look almost like the original two, but it might look kind of not perfect, but it will look kind of like it. Um, and this should be kind of surprising in a sense, or like counterintuitive, because we forced it to go through this sort of bottleneck of information where there's only three neurons. So what we're doing is we're forcing the network to learn a very, very compact representation of this data. Uh, and if you do, this layer, which we can call Z, um, some, you'll see, you'll hear sometimes people refer to it as like a Z space. It's like this latent variable. Um, this Z is very valuable because uh, it contains this almost like a signature. An another um, interpretation is it's like, it's like compression. So like when you compress something, our compression algorithms make something much smaller and more abstract, right? Where you we're trying to take advantage of, of repeating patterns in the data or, or high level features to compress it in such a way that we can decompress it and get the original or something close to it. Uh, so this is kind of, now this wouldn't be very useful for the actual like data compression in computers because it's not a very good compression function, but it works kind of in this way. We're compressing the information. Um, and then we can think of the left half of this as the encoder. So you can like uh, you can encode data into this hidden variable, and then you can decode from it into the original. And so um, so imagine just this sort of the right half of this, the right hemisphere. Um, we can use this to generate new images. So now you know if we use original data, we'll get some some vector for z, and then it will become the reconstructed output. But we can put in anything for Z, and the network has been conditioned so that it produces samples that look like the original data. So we can start putting in new vectors for Z and generating new, new images that look like they came from that distribution. Um, so that's the five minute autoencoder <laughs> uh, tutorial there. And in principle, there's like there's two different kinds of autoencoders which you'll encounter. And we're going to talk about variational autoencoders, which are used to produce images. There's also something called the denoising autoencoder, which is used to kind of learn a model which is able to um, like remove loss or, or like work with lossy uh, lossy signals and remove noise from from images and things like that. 
Um, but variational autoencoders are used to produce images that look like they came from sample data. So like this is an example that's trained on the MNIST data. And what's cool about this is that suppose, in, if, suppose we actually have two neurons in Z, then we can use, then we can graph them, right? It, it's almost like TSNI. We can use these two, we can plot, we can take all these samples, uh, we can pass them through, we can take their reconstructions, and then we can plot them according to where they appear in, um, in this Z space. And if you do that, you'll find that it works kind of like TSNI. So we have all of these ones that are clustered together, and here are these sevens, and the nines turn into sevens, and you see that like um, the in the variational autoencoder, the the interpretation of the z space, and it's almost like a smooth parameter parameterization of the uh, the data that we're that we trained it on, um, which is really really neat uh, because. Now we can, we can sort of like, I think what a, a nice analogy that I like to use is, is to Perlin noise. So people are kind of familiar here with Perlin noise. This is like Perlin noise to the extreme because it's, it's instead of uh, using the Perlin noise function, which is giving you some smooth, you know, like um, sort of organic 2D or 3D manifold that you can traverse to create noisy terrains. This instead is learning a distribution which is conditional to the thing that it was trained on. So it's like, it's like um, Perlin noise that's trained on the, Im the images that you gave it, and it learns this representation uh, uh, in this generative space of the images that you can kind of like, you can think of as like sliders. You know, you can kind of, uh, if, you, if you like change these slightly, you know, you have some Z variable, and you start to kind of change them slightly, they'll make slight changes to the output. And so you can kind of traverse the generative space of this of this thing, and that's kind of neat. Um, so, like for example, these are uh, these are stick figures. <laughs> this is trained on a whole bunch of stick figures, and it started making new stick figures. So this is this is the whole notion of a generative model. We're able to now the network itself is producing the images. So that's the output. It's just pixels. Um, and like for example, I, I trained the autoencoder on the data set of, celeb of celebrities' faces. <laughs> and then if you can you can take subsets of the data like you can take all the images of like for example people with eyeglasses and then you can train an autoencoder on it and then have it generate new faces so these are totally synthetic faces uh, that uh, and it will learn these properties you know it, it, it will take all these faces of people with eyeglass uh, with eyeglasses on them or sunglasses and it will um, create this, like, it will create fake images in this generative space, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, yeah? Uh, is this the same idea as, like, creating, if you give someone all, like, a composer's music and then tries to make the same? Uh, well, that, that might be accomplished in different ways. So, like, the first ways that people would try to compose music from, from a from data sets is like with Markov chains. Mm -hmm. um, I think in principle you could you could think about using an autoencoder in this way. Um, I think though for music people tend to use RNNs, so recurring neural networks, because it's kind of a sequence. So here there's no really time component. Um, mm -hmm. It's just like some distribution of data in, uh, that's fixed. Um, so this probably wouldn't be used for that. You cannot do this like uh, this out. Uh, there are different applications of using them together, yeah. Um, and actually, we saw one. Uh, one of them was the, the network that, when we looked at the, in, in the section of recurring neural networks, the thing that was training uh, the draw, that was drawing house numbers. So there was, um, and that was actually using an autoencoder to, to draw the numbers, but it was using a recurring neural network to guide the, to guide like the part of the canvas that it was drawing on, so that was an example where an autoencoder is used in the recurrent neural network. Uh, so another kind of uh, generative model is called a deep convolutional generative adversarial network, which is the name of my new band. I think the deep, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and um, what DC GANs do? Uh, sometimes we call them DC GANs. They also do this sort of. Uh, they generate pictures that look like they came from some distribution. What am I doing on time? It's 4.30. Um, okay, we'll kind of finish DC GANs and then we'll, we'll take a break and then we'll get into game stuff. Um, so DC GANs are used to 
um, produce, they're used to generate images that look like they came from a training set. So these are fake images that came from a data set of bedrooms, which is a really funny data set. I think they just used it because they found a really big one. Um, and it was made by, by these three guys, so Alec Radford, Luke Metz, and, and Summit Chintala. Uh, and it's very similar to a variational autoencoder, but it has a slightly different architecture. So instead of, um, instead of doing this, there's actually two networks. Well, uh, let me start by saying, like, what, what is, um, there's kind of a, almost a trivial, uh, a trivial weakness to this, to this for generating images which is that um, the way that, that we train it, the loss function that we use is reconstruction error, which is just pixel to pixel differences. So we want x to be equal to x prime, um, but that's a very naive way of measuring how similar x is to x prime, just the pixel by pixel subtractions, right? Because suppose that, and suppose for example that we trained the network and then the x prime that was generated from x was exactly the same as x, except everything was shifted by a pixel, right? So then to our eyes, they would look identical, but to here, they'd actually be not identical at all because all the pixels are offset by one. So the, the loss function that's used in, in the variational autoencoder, um, and I think there's different, I suppose there are probably there are different ways of improving autoencoders to not have that kind of a naive loss function, but, but typically like the vanilla autoencoder that we see here, it has that loss function and it's not very good. It's kind of naive, you know, pixel to pixel reconstruction. So what, it, what, a, what generative adversarial networks do instead is they use two, um, <clears throat> they use two networks, and in this, in this case it's two convolutional neural networks. One is what's called a discriminator and one is a generator. And the generator is essentially almost exactly the same as this. It's just a, a convolutional neural network, which will start with some, like, you'll feed it some noise, you know, some sort of an input variable, which is like the latent variable, and it will produce an image. Um, and then it has a discriminator, which is very similar to the kinds of convolutional neural networks which we've seen before. That's just doing classification. And the way that they're trained, the, the way that it works, is that you have this generator that's producing images and you have a discriminator which is trying to tell whether the images produced by the generator are fake, i.e. they were produced by the generator, or that they're real, as in they came from the training set. So the discriminator is trying to, the generator is trying to fool the discriminator. It's trying to give it images that look real and it's trying to make the discriminator say these are images from the training set. <laughs> and then the discrimin and so they're sort of locked in battle, right? The generator is trying to produce com images that look real, and the discriminator is trying to tell them apart from from actual real images. And if you train them jointly at the same time, that there's like this optimization that you're trying to you're trying to achieve this balance between them, they'll both become much better over time, over iterations, and eventually the generator is able to produce images that look really real, like this, right? Um, and what's cool is, like an autoencoder, it, it's characterized by this Z space. It's like this latent variable, which we can play with like a Perlin noise lever. And as we adjust this latent variable, we create smooth um, changes in the output of the generators uh, of the generator. So, for example, we're looking at this is producing fake bedrooms, and you'll see like as you trace it, it's like a window turns into a door. You know, or like, um, or like a window just sort of melts into the wall, or a pillow becomes a lamp, or something like that. Um, and and that's that's really neat because it's because we don't tell the generate we don't tell the DC again ahead of time what any of these things mean. It's completely unsupervised, so it kind of learns representations um, where similar things are sort of sim are 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 organized in a way that like in the in the generative space they appear they're kind of close to each other if that makes any it doesn't even make sense to me so <laughs> don't worry if it if it's it's flying flying over you um, you can so you could do all this like really cool you know producing hallucinations of bedroom junk um, or faces uh, and you can do arithmetic on these faces which is really cool so this is like 
like taking these latent variables. So now we, we talked about this in the first week, but we didn't talk about how it can be done. So this is just taking those z variables. So suppose you produce an image of these, uh, the, the like you take a particular z variable which produces these, you know, pictures of smiling woman, and you find the same uh, a z vector which produces this neutral woman and the z vector which produces neutral man. If you take those z vectors and you apply arithmetic to them, so you take this z vector, subtract this one from it, and then add this one, you will actually produce um, images which which correspond to that arithmetic. So here we're like we're subtracting, we're basically turning, going from smiling woman to smiling man by subtracting neutral woman, adding neutral man. So that's that's kind of a, a neat property of these. Um, or like we can put sunglasses on people. Uh, and again, it, it has this, the Z space is very smooth. So again, this is your crazy Perlin noise variable, um, which when we, tra we can traverse it and generate these interpolations between different um, generative uh, Z vectors, or the outputs of these generative Z vectors. Uh, and it can, com it's able to produce very compelling, like very real looking samples from whatever it was trained on. So like if we train it on MNIST, these are real. These actually come from the real data, uh, like the real MNIST data set. And these are fake. So these are hallucinated by the machine, and they look like real numbers that people drew, but they totally aren't. And that's pretty, that's pretty wild. Um, and again, like, so this is something I did. So that just produced uh, an interpolating between the different image classes. And you see that it finds like, very smooth ways of interpolating between numbers. Um, so that's kind of a fun thing. I showed you this project, I think, briefly in the first week. This is a project I did in December called A Book from the Sky, which is named for the book by the, by the Chinese artist Xu Bing, where he produced fake characters. Um, so really, actually, the project that I showed you earlier by Hardmaru, uh, probably that should be called A Book from the Sky, because he was actually generating fake characters, like Xu Bing did, whereas I was generating fake images of real characters. So these are actual Chinese characters, um, which are hallucinated by the machine. You, you can actually read them in theory. Um, these are the actual, this is the data set that I found. These are handwritten characters collected by a university in Beijing, which was studying uh, optical character recognition. And then these are pairs of generated characters and real characters. And you can see that they're, they're, they're not, you can usually tell <clears throat> if it was generated by a machine, but it's, it's, it's fairly convincing. Uh, reasonably, and so it can be used. Sorry. Oh, oh no. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is, is that right? Okay, that's good to know. So that these look like basically the scribblings of children. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> um, okay, but the cool thing is because of this generative space. I can interp we can interpolate characters into each other, right? So we can do these like, well, this is just, you know, interpolating. This is just taking that Z vector. Again, the Perlin noise analogy is really useful here. <clears throat> if you kind of, um, if you take these characters, and they, they do have labels, so we can condition them on the, on the labels, and then you um, kind of move around this generative space, you can produce different versions of the same characters, or you can interpolate between characters. Right, so these are interpolations between different characters, and you can see that they're pretty smooth. Um, again, I, I showed all of this on the, on the first day. Uh, so that's pretty neat. Uh, it preserves radicals, which is, which is a kind of, if you cherry pick them, so it doesn't always do that, but I pick the ones that, that it does do that for, and then I, I took the liberty of highlighting them red for you. Um, and then, um, yeah, the arithmetic thing, this is really stretching it, so I, I hesitate to even include this in the deck, but... But but um, yeah, this is the this is what should be the character for queen, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, you can produce so, so this works by other people. So this someone trained it in flowers uh, to produce fake flowers. Someone produced fake manga characters. <laughs> um, this was um, this is actually and I don't know exactly. This is Hard Muru again. Um, he does. You guys should look at this guy's blog. He does lots of really crazy experiments with, like visual experiments with, with, um, with generative algorithms in, in machine learning, especially generative, uh, uh, generative models. So this is a, he actually uses, 
uh, generative adversarial networks and, and autoencoders together to produce these very high res images. So like I did this too, but mine was very small. It was just trained in MNIST, but these are actually super high res. So, so that's kind of, that's pretty neat. Um, so just check out this guy's blog. It's really, really nice. Um, okay, well, that's the end of uh, GANs. Um, so what we're going to do, we'll take a quick break, and um, when we get back, we'll talk about video games. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's pause there. Okay, we're going to talk about reinforcement learning, which is another branch of machine learning that we haven't talked about, and we're going to do it in the context of games, um, which should be fun. I actually, this is the last slide, but I realize this should totally be the first slide. I think this is what we're going <laughs> to basically do. And I want to start actually with a couple of quotes, which I found, which I dug up yesterday. Has anybody read the book, The Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesse? Is that okay? So a few of you are familiar with it. Um, so this book was written by Hesse in, I think, the 1930s or something, and it was published in 1943, or roughly then. And it's about this game called The Glass Bead Game. <clears throat> which is played by this like advanced intellectual <clears throat> cast of people in like the 26th century of Europe or something. It's really, really, um, it's a really, really amazing book and I highly recommend it. And I'm going to pick a quote from it to say, uh, a game, for example, might start from a given astronomical configuration or from the actual theme of a Bach fugue or from a sentence out of Leibniz or the Upanishads and from this theme depending on the intentions and talents of the player, it could either further explore and elaborate the initial motif, or else enrich its expressiveness by allusions to kindred concepts. It represented an elite symbolic form of seeking for perfection, a sublime alchemy, an approach to that mind which beyond all images and multiplicities is one within itself. In other words, to God. <laughs> and that's by Herman Hesse. And... I don't know if it's known in America, but in Europe it was really known, the game. The game? Yeah. What's it called? Is it called the glass bead game? I mean, I know the translation. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Hmm. But it had this little one, like, little marbles. Mm -hmm. Like glass, sort of a glass bead with something inside. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was inspired by the book, who knows? Sure. Well, so the game that they're alluding to is this game in which, like, uh, this pristine order of intellectuals who are like removed from society are creating these uh, parallels between disparate fields like music and and uh, uh, literature or vision you know painting and uh, mathematics or you know things like this and for me when I read this I every every time like I look at games in AI or neural networks in general I'm constantly reminded of this book because uh, of this, like, and they never talk about the rules of the game, too. That's another really interesting thing. They never describe what the game, the rules, the rules of the game are. It's just that this, like, this synthesis of different kinds of expressions being morphed into each other and, and paralleled. And so I'm constantly thinking of this book, and I don't think I have a very good way of... Uh, <laughs> of uh, clarifying what I mean. It's kind of maybe some sort of an impressionistic impressionistic thing, but for me it's very relevant. And I'm going to also uh, show you this quote by Lisa Dahl, who we're going to talk about a lot um, when we talk about AlphaGo. I will do my best to play a beautiful and interesting game, and he's talking about the game of Go. And um, it's pretty, it, what's really interesting about Go is that people use these words to describe it. Like the game is beautiful or interesting, and we don't usually like like, even in chess, I don't think people use this terminology so much. And the reason is because, and we'll see this when we talk about the mechanics of Go, there's so much intuition behind it that, like, for many years, no one really thought that uh, an AI could be designed to play it because it, it felt so, so, like, such a human thing, like the kind of thing that you can't really assign algorithms to. And we're going to see how we've kind of overcome that, maybe. Um, okay. So the context of all this video game stuff is going to be, uh, is in the context of this branch of machine learning called reinforcement learning. And the basic premise behind uh, reinforcement learning is that we have these two things. There's an agent and there's an environment. And the agent is interacting with its environment. 
and uh, the agent is able to take actions. That is to say, it has agency. It's able to take these actions, which, uh, which, create, uh, which has consequences on its environment. So um, this is very different from what we've seen so far in machine learning. All of the problems that we've dealt with so far have been sort of static or like removed from, from uh, an environment. You know, so when we talk about uh, piping images through covenants or using recurrent neural networks, we're kind of doing something to, with some existing data set that we get to see all of it up front and learn something about it. But there isn't some sort of an ongoing simulation. And uh, with reinforcement learning, now we're talking about scenarios that include agents which take actions, which affect their environments, and uh, potentially there's some sort, and, and almost always actually, there's a notion of a reward function, um, which is not necessarily very straightforward. Um, but um, obviously, like, this is already probably indicating something about video games, right? This is kind of the premise behind video games, where, where we are an agent, and we're controlling the video game's environment, and we have a score. <laughs> so there's usually a score in games, uh, which we can think of as a reward function. And this, the notion of uh, actions and states is uh, straightforward enough. The notion of rewards is a bit more controversial. So the question is, can you really, uh, like, uh, structure real-world scenarios in this way where we have some sort of a, sig like a reward signal, which is just a number, which is telling us how good we're doing. So this is a lot less straightforward, and, it, and it's something that we can probably spend the whole day talking about, whether what the limitations of, of um, such an interpretation to uh, agent environment scenarios is. Uh, but for better or worse, that's kind of how, what the state of reinforcement learning is right now. Um, so we have in uh, most reinforcement learning scenarios, we have three things here that we're, we're working with at the same time. There's a state, there's, an, there's actions, and there's a re rewards, right? And the state is kind of like the environment. So everything that describes the environment and the agent's position in it. The action, actions are things that the agent can do to affect the environment or interact with it. And reward is some, you know, some that is deriving something good uh, from its actions. And, um, and reinforcement learning, uh, this is actually, this is a quote from Jan LeCun, who, who I've talked about a few times. He was one of the people that first brought convolutional neural networks to the forefront. Uh, and um, he's actually affiliated with NYU, although I think he spends most of his time at Facebook. Uh, but he wrote... This, and I kind of like this quote he wrote, if intelligence was a cake, unsupervised learning would be the cake, supervised learning would be the icing on the cake, and reinforcement learning would be the cherry on the cake. We know how to make the icing and the cherry, but we don't know how to make the cake. <laughs> so unsupervised learning is we have all this unordered data, and we're trying to derive structure from it. So like that's what Cubnets do really well. They uh, derive useful high high level features uh, autonomously for us um, which are much more valuable than the disordered purely you know sensory data that we're receiving from images and sounds and so on and then supervised learning is trying to take that and kind of make it smaller you know it's like we're we're creating classifications and and um, you know mapping high level data or high high volume data into low volume data which has more value uh, and then reinforcement learning is the cherry on the cake, I suppose, uh, I suppose is as good as any of an analogy. Uh, and it's how to act upon unsupervised and supervised learned data. And um, reinforcement learning, another analogy that I think is useful is like if we're dealing with robotics, unsupervised learning and supervised learning is kind of like everything that the brain does. So if, like, if you have a robot and it's got a brain, the brain is doing unsupervised and supervised learning, and the body is the reinforcement learning, uh, is reinforcement learning. So it's like interacting with the environment. So reinforcement learning is super important in, in robotics, right? Because now we're dealing with agents in an environment which impact their environment, uh, and that's, that, that's super important. Um, so reinforcement learning has tons and tons of applications. So robotics I just mentioned, um, how to control robots, um, it can also, like we often view it for, through the lens of robotics, but it can be useful in industrial and commercial applications as well. 
Um, and actually, these applications will make a little more sense after we've, we've described it a bit more formally. Um, I think maybe... Yeah, let me, let me just quickly say a few things about the state and reward and actions. And um, actually, no, let me, let me get back to this. I think those, the state will be, this, those, those things will become a little clearer once, we, once we've looked at some of the actual applications. Um, so these are some of the applications, and, and they'll make more sense when we've looked at one particular one. So what we're going to look at is uh, a system that was designed by this group called DeepMind, which was bought by Google. Uh, so now Google has this group called DeepMind, which is mostly working on reinforcement learning algorithms. And they um, are quite notable for having written a paper last year, which was in, uh, in Nature magazine, uh, or the, in Nature, so the, the, the very you know, prestigious journal, uh, in which they described a system of uh, reinforcement learning in which they trained an agent to play Atari games and beat them and play, play these Atari games very well. So we're usually, like, you, we know of AIs as adversaries in, in video games. So, like, when you're working with Goombas in, in Mario or whatever, um, we know those. But those are really stupid, right? What's really hard, though, is to design an AI which, which is the protagonist in the video game and can beat it. Uh, and they designed a system which does this with Atari, with Atari games. Uh, now, what's really interesting about this, and actually, like, let, well, let, let's just first describe this diagram. So this, this gets back to how this is an application of this. So here, we have an agent, which is the protagonist of the video game, and it can take a set of actions, which we call, you know, they're labeled A, which is coming from the joystick. And then the state is, is the video game screen. And what's really interesting about this is that they, they, they trained a machine learned function to play these video games, and, it, and they trained one, basically. Like they have, they designed a single algorithm which can learn how to play any Atari game, no matter what it is. So like, it, we're looking at a few, a few of them. So these are all uh, different Atari games. So if this is Sequest, um, Pong, Space Invaders and uh, Breakout on the bottom left. And I'm going to look at all of these in turn. But basically, and maybe uh, we should fast forward to where they're actually doing well. <laughs> uh, so these are all examples of autonomous computers playing these video games and playing them very well. And what's really interesting is that they're all being played by a single algorithm. And that's really, that's what's really amazing about this because all of these games have different rules, they have different objectives, they have different uh, elements in them, different characters, and so on. They're completely different, right? Within some narrow spectrum, obviously they're all Atari games, so they're not super complex, but, but they all have, they're all pretty different from each other in terms of the objectives, right? And so uh, the reason, and so that's what really what's impressive about this. They wanted, their goal was to create a single algorithm which could learn how to play any Atari game, regardless of the rules. Uh, so usually, you know, this, this might feel like a very hard task for us because how do you program a computer to not only learn how to interact with the environment, but learn what the reward is? You know, it has to learn what the objective is from just playing it. Uh, and we're going to get into exactly how that's done. Uh, or not, I shouldn't say exactly how that's done. <laughs> but, but to some degree, we're going to see how that's done. So um, the state of these games is simply the pixels of the screen. So when the, uh, the algorithm receives all the information from the video game, from the Atari, all it receives are the raw pixels. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, so for Space Invaders, it doesn't, it, the information that we're dealing with isn't like, here's the location of all these bad guys and the location of your paddle. Uh, it's just pixels and colors. Uh, and that's done for all of them, right? So there's no structured information in what the machine is receiving. It's all just pixels. And so that's, that makes the problem really imposing. So that's the only data that we receive. It's just these pixels. And then we're, we're, besides for the state, we're also receiving a reward. And the reward is usually the game score. 
So all of these typically have a single number which tells us our score. So in Space Invaders, it's like the number of these baddies that you've shot. Uh, in Pong, it's like the number of points you've scored, maybe minus the number of points your opponent has scored. Uh, and, you know, so it's a single number. And we tell the machine, uh, and also the actions is just the joystick. So you have a finite set of things that you can do with a joystick, uh, and it will be the actions that you take upon the environment. So what we tell the machine is, okay, given these pixels and given the constant signal of your, of your reward, uh, learn a way to take actions to increase your reward scores. And it does it for all of these games effectively. So that's pretty impressive. And we'll get into, we'll get into the mechanics of how that's done. Um, Is it uh, always an individual number? Like one number? Yeah, uh, yeah. In all of these examples, it is one. I don't think that's a rule. Like, I think there could be more complicated reward functions, but I'm not familiar enough with it to, to tell you offhand if there's any that do use it. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. But all of these have one. So it's like a scalar reward. So let's look at like Pong, for example. So when these systems start, they don't know anything about their environment. So this is our AI. And as you can see, it's not very good at playing Pong. It's just letting these, the, the balls come, come past it. And after a while, it starts to figure out like, okay, if I move the joystick around randomly, sometimes the ball will hit me and I'll be able to hit it back. And occasionally I'll even score a point. And so this is our score. And so after some amount of training, we're able to effectively control this paddle. And after enough training, it's become competitive with the other, with the other paddle. Right, so this is kind of a weak AI, and this is the AI that we're training. And uh, if we go, OK, so now 10 hours of training. This is sped up by four times. This is just the video sped up. But you can see that now, now our AI is, is, is doing really well. It's scoring. It's basically become unbeatable. So it's 5 nothing, 6 nothing. Uh, and yeah, so we've built an AI that's effective at playing Pong. And the way it's done this is it's receiving constant feedback. It's given a set of, it's given a state, which is just the pixels. It's given the reward, which is this. And it knows historically what actions it took at each of those game states. And it is uh, now beginning to associate different, uh, different states, different actions that it took that potentially led it to get a positive reward. Okay, and we're going to see, yep? Yeah? How did it know to move itself at all? What's that? Well, how did it know so at first, it's just, uh, we'll see when we talk about how this is structured, but it, it's just taking random, it's just like random. So when it doesn't know what actions are good for, and what actions are bad, it just tries everything, basically, and then it starts to learn some actions are better than other actions in particular states. But it must know that one state is better than the other, like it, that sort of, it must be built to sort of say find a reward in Well, yeah, it's trying to it's trying to optimize like getting a high reward by virtue of its actions, and so it has to learn to it has to associate actions that it takes with the states, uh, which and, and to to figure out how to get that award. Mm -hmm. Good. Sure, I have two questions. Yeah. One is uh, it knows that in this game it's on the X Y or it tries it doesn't, everything. It doesn't right? know x, y. It, but it's, not it, like, it's not only y, is uh, Well, okay, so in this case, it is, it is constrained to only go up, down, so there is no left, right here. Uh, but um, it doesn't really, kn it doesn't know what, where the paddle is. All it knows is just like, joystick. I have a joystick, it's like it's blindfolded. It's just like, I have a joystick and I have a constant reward signal coming to me. So probably it tries uh, X as well, but it doesn't Yeah, yeah, exactly. It learned that X is not doing anything. Also, um, does it know like the other component, like the, the other person or the machine um, scored? The other, oh, um, I, I think the reward in Pong is probably your score minus your opponent's score. I could be wrong about that, actually. I didn't read carefully. But it definitely has to be one number. And so I'm assuming it's something like, like the difference. Yeah. Um, did, does it know that there's a, a ball or a ball? No. It so uh, have... just knows pixels. Because if it were to know it's a ball, we would have to program that, really. And then it's not a gen generic algorithm because not uh, every game has a ball. But because you said it, it's, it's, it's 
driving, and it has a joystick, but it's blindfolded. So mm -hmm. then, yeah. getting all these points would be points, random. Well, like it, it's the movement it's, that seems like if, if you couldn't, you know, if you can't see yeah, where you're like, mm -hmm. going, how do you know? It, it develops relationships sure. between its actions, like through randomness, and then it starts to get reinforced based on the fact that its score goes up and the reward goes up. And it looks back at what it took to get those rewards, and it starts to develop like an idea of, like, if I keep doing this against what this data is, if it kind of pixels are, then I'm going to mm -hmm. keep achieving that reward. And we'll, we'll see, like, oh, we're going to get into the mechanics of this just a little bit, and hopefully that, that might clear it up. But yeah, it doesn't, all it knows is, is it just sees, it does see what the screen, but it doesn't know that like, we don't have like the position of the paddle. We just know that the, those green pixels, you know, where the paddle is, we know that those pixels are green. But it must, it must has, have an input like either up or down, right? It, it's so actions, yeah, it has an up and down. The output layer mm -hmm. is like, go up after this frame. Uh, so it, is it by every frame, it takes an action. Yes, it takes an action at every frame. Okay. Or so at every frame. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's only planning one frame ahead at any given. Yes. Uh, that's a good question, actually. I, it takes one action at a time. I think you would say, yeah, it's just sort of as it goes, yeah. I mean, it tends to have trajectories, right, in the same way that we do, you know, so you might follow through on something over many frames, but at any given time, it takes one action. This is Breakout, so this is a really cool example, too, so um, everyone knows this game, everyone's played a variant of it, right, you have to, like, it's like Pong, except you're just trying to break the blocks, right, so at first, it's really bad, right, and then after some amount of time, it begins to learn that if you hit the, you know, if you move the paddle around and make contact with the, with the ball, it starts to hit it back, and it starts to hit these squares. And after a certain amount of time, it becomes pretty good at this game. Like, it starts to capture the ball. <laughs> uh, but what's, okay, so here's what's really cool about this, and this is, this is why this is a good example. After enough training, it figures out that the optimal strategy for this is to dig a tunnel Right to to put the ball to make like one long tunnel and put it on on top of it like like to get it on the other side, and this is kind of funny because if you read the paper, it talks about how like the the people who wrote this the, this system, they themselves like they don't play the game, so they they didn't know that you could do that, and then the robot figured out that like oh that's the best way to to win this game is to build one of these tunnels. Okay. Um, this is Sea Quest, so it's like it has to shoot things? I don't know. Um, so at first it's just kind of swimming along and then eventually like it's a mean fighting machine basically. This, yeah. It just figures out like okay I have to I have to shoot things in the water. <laughs> um, okay so I just want to reiterate again like um, and I think I have one more. Yeah here's Space Invaders. Right? So I just want to reiterate like two, two things. One is that like a single algorithm was applied to each of these games individually and, and learned how to play them all. So that's really great because it implies that this is a somewhat ge generic approach, that it could be applied to other kinds of games and really other kinds of situations altogether. Right? So, and that's kind of like what we're really striving for in, in, in reinforcement learning uh, in particular, but really in machine learning in general. We want things that, we want algorithms that kind of like are able to uh, work in, in a general sense. And sometimes um, people now use the word, art, uh, people use the phrase artificial general intelligence to distinguish it from, from uh, a lot of things that have become associated with artificial intelligence, which aren't general. Um, so like the, the goal of hard AI, you know, like, like um, what we mean by hard AI is, is like AIs that are basically smarter than humans. The goal is like a general intelligence like we have. So you can take this and you can give it and put it into a totally new scenario and it will learn how to interact with the world. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's super important. I'll get into that. I'll get into this uh, in a second. Um, but just also to, again, to reiterate why this is important in, in the context of some of the applications we talked about. So like with robotics, right, um, we are, or let's use it, let's, 
yeah, let's use the example of robotics. Um, we need to build these systems so that they are they can interact with their world in the way that we desire, which means that we don't want robots that destroy things by accident or run into babies or you know hit dogs or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and so it's really important to be able to learn on the fly. And so that's kind of what reinforcement learning is all about. And we take this for granted, right? So like when you're a baby, if you touch something that's hot, you'll know right away uh, not to touch that again, right? So you learn from one exposure to hot things that you don't want to touch them. You learn uh, the meanings of words. This is really crazy stuff about babies. Infants learn uh, the meanings of words upon one exposure to hearing that word which is really crazy. So crazy. adults are not good at that, huh? Oh. It's not. Oh, it is, right? Yeah, it's really crazy. Uh, so like babies are really good reinforcement learning agents. And uh, for us to make computers capable of the same behavior, you know, when we, when we talk about uh, neural networks, we see that they need thousands of examples to understand what a three is, right? So uh, we see that we're, we're kind of far behind in this, in this regard. Uh, but it's very important for us to be able to make things that learn quickly so that they don't destroy the environment and also because they will do the things that we want them to do more effectively, more safely, and so on. Okay. Um, so the, all of these um, agents are structured a, a, as what's called a Markov decision process. So like with Markov chains, we've talked about like, uh, we haven't really talked about Markov, Markov structure, Markov chains, or, or um, Markov decision processes very much, but like the, the essential thing to understand is that like we can model this as like uh, we have a finite set of actions and we have a finite set of states and actions go from one state to another. Um, the, now typ ty typically it's much, much bigger than this, right? This is a very simplified diagram, uh, but we, uh, we understand that there's this like relationship between actions and states that can be modeled by uh, a decision process which is to say that like a sequence of actions will get us to a certain state. And so, um, and, and the time nature of this is actually really important, right? So what's really hard about this? What are the challenges? One is that uh, unlike previous machine learning systems that we've talked about, this is a dynamical system in the sense that like it evolves one uh, frame at a time and it's dynamic because our actions will impact future events and um, it can evolve in any number of ways and so that so it becomes very difficult to predict we have to be predicting the environment as we go um, and this is kind of coupled with this notion of time mattering um, this is a really hard one and i personally am struggling to understand myself like how this is really uh, dealt with effectively is the no is the notion that the reward you know there's a reward signal coming in but it's delayed right so if we take a particular action that will eventually lead to a reward, uh, it's not obvious what action actually led to that reward because it's delayed, right? Because we'll, we'll get points for it later. And so we have to be able to, and this is coupled with this notion of a credit assignment, we have to be able to assign credit. We have to say this action led to this reward, so we want to uh, do this action more. So this is a really difficult problem. That, that these things are decoupled. And so it's very difficult to, to simply associate states with actions uh, in, a, in a positive way because we don't necessarily, we don't necessarily have an obvious way of linking uh, good actions to good rewards. And also, of course, the, the information is very low, low quality. It's just pixels in this case. Um, but that's also good because it means it generalizes. So anything that can be structured this way pixels reward actions can be applied to with this um, this sort of in, in reinforcement learning. And um, in practice, the way that this has been achieved by people using neural networks anyway, and deep neural networks in, pra in, in practice, is, um, has been called uh, deep Q learning. And um, I don't know why they use the letter Q. It refers to this function, this like the Q function, which is kind of like um, Q, the Q function, I don't have a slide for this actually, I should probably add a slide to this, but basically Q function is, is like the function that we're trying to derive, which says given any state, given any state, what is the action I should take? So it's a function, it goes from a state to an action, 
And it's called Q for some reason, so it's like um, Q of a state and, and a set, set of actions. Um, and, uh, and we can use, surprise, surprise, neural networks to, uh, to, to, model, to actually effectively learn it. Um, and we're going to see just how that works. So yes, CovNets to the rescue. So um, did I mention that convolutional neural networks are magical? Because uh, as you can see, here's yet another application of them, is that they are now used in, in deep Q learning. And this is coming from this paper. This is the paper itself, where they first demonstrated the use of these, um, uh, these techniques for beating Atari games. And the way it's structured is that we're receiving these pixels, and um, there's a couple components which I'm going to kind of gloss over. So there's like a pre-processing step where they uh, are able to like, there's all kinds of weird things you have to deal with with Atari. There's like a flicker and there's a, a scan rate and it's limited by the number of sprites it can show at any time. So they kind of, they, they make a system that's able to, to deal with this. Uh, but then the input that the, this convolution, so they build a convolutional neural network, which is receiving an input of, of not just one frame, but actually four frames. Uh, I think four frames. So it's receiving the previous four frames that are kind of stacked together. So it's like an, it's like an image of, in four blocks of the previous four game states. And, um, and then it's going through a series of convolutions and, and, and pooling and so on. Uh, I think they have pooling layers. Uh, and then finally to fully connected layers. And then the last fully connected layer is your, is your actions. So it's mapping from pixels to actions. So it goes from our game state to our joystick, which has a series of actions, which is just arrows or arrows combined with the button, right? And that this is kind of how Atari games work. They just have a joystick and a button. And uh, the goal of this convolutional neural network is given any input, tell us what, you know, output, what the best action should be, right? So just, just to reiterate, this fits the sort of schema of all of the neural networks that we've seen so far with, with, with uh, feed-forward neural networks, right? It has some input, and it will predict the, the best action to take, right? So this is the essence of, of Q-learning, is that we're using these deep neural networks, uh, deep convolutional neural networks, to map from the game space, the state space, to the, um, to the joystick. Now, what's really difficult, and what we're not going to talk so much about, is um, is like how this is trained and how it's a little different. So, like the lo the function that we're trying to optimize is is a little bit more complex than than previous functions that we've tried to optimize, where it's just like you know when we were dealing with image classification, the loss function was pretty simple, right? It was just like the class label. Is it is this the correct class label? Here, the function has to take into account all of these challenges that we've mentioned, where it doesn't, it receives a, a reward signal, and it doesn't know, uh, it doesn't necessarily know how to associate it with a game state. Um, and furthermore, it ha another challenge is that um, there are a few things that we kind of have to decide, like, like um, uh, there's there's this notion of um, of uh, what's called a discount factor which tells us how important are rewards now versus rewards in the future. So this is uh, another thing that we kind of have to deal with because, uh, and actually when we get into, when we get into uh, Go and chess, and I hope I leave myself enough time to do them, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more explicitly, this notion of like delayed reward versus, versus now. Um, but basically the thing to take away from this is we can use a covnet to understand the pixels because that's what they're good at, right? They're good. They're good at turning low density pixels into high level, um, you know, objects. And actually, in the next slide, we'll demonstrate this kind of nicely. So, if we um, take this neural network, train it on uh, what is this? This is Space Invaders, and we train this this um, deep Q this deep Q learning network on states of the game uh, Space Invaders. And then we can actually um, do use our old friend Tisney to group different game states according to uh, that, that second to last layer before the, um, the action that, that it's taken. Uh, and actually, I don't remember what the color coding is. Oh, I think, uh, I think it 
mix this in with human players too. So like the one of the orange ones are yeah, orange is humans and blue is is the robots. So these are all different game states. And you can see that so what's really interesting, you see these game states, it's the it's there's these three right here, they're close to each other because they resemble each other. Like these have some sort of a like a formation, like a horizontal formation of these baddies that appears in different parts of the screen. This one has like what appears to be an almost like an upside down L of baddies. Uh, and that's interesting because, you know, again, like pixels are very low density information, but we can, we can learn this high level representation which tells us more interesting things about the game state. And it's finding things that are useful for um, these actions. Uh, which is like it wants to know when it has a horizontal row of these because that might guide the action in some meaningful way. So like it wants to be, so if you have a, hor I, I, I don't know about space invaders, like if you have a horizontal row of them, you, you want to kind of go from left to right and shoot them or something. So we'll see that like different actions that, um, you know, when game states that require kind of the same actions will be, will find themselves near to each other in this representation after it's been trained. Um, so I know that's kind of strange. This is a really good paper, um, and I, uh, I guess I blocked. This will be in the notes. The links will be in the notes. Um, but um, where they talk about some of the finer details of this. Um, okay, so this is kind of uh, an aside, and this has nothing to do with what we're talking about. But like, there's this subculture in video games of making the hardest possible levels in video games. So like, you know, you can make there are emulators for like Super Mario World where you can make your own levels and there's this subculture of people making like impossible levels so like this is one that I found on YouTube that's like um, crazy scrolling level how many people played Super Mario World growing up? pretty much everyone right? okay just watch this level it's like it's absolute insanity and I guess this is a human player who has probably taken like many parts of many things the whole day to like I knew this would be the most popular part of the lecture. <laughs> Alright, this is my favorite part. He jumps through the whole sequence of these. <laughs> He's hopping the key. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's just cheating death. That's cheating death. It's gonna speed up. Actually, this, this this part, this is the last part of it, and this is just gonna be totally insane. <laughs> Scrolling horror, it's called. <laughs> so I mentioned that because, um, I, yeah, I, I mentioned this because um, I can just imagine like there being an arms race between people making like video game levels that are that are extremely hard for AIs to learn, and then people like training AI algorithms to play these perfectly. Because it, eventually, like that would that would be a really good barometer of these if they could like play arbitrarily hard Super Mario World levels and they could learn how to play them. Um, also, I just want to show this video. This is like some somebody did this in basically in real life. So like one really, and this is a very popular like hello world for reinforcement learning is balancing something on a pole. And um, someone actually like set up a reinforcement learning system to balance a pole in real life. Right, so like here it's just, it, it, the goal is to balance the um, that blue pole and it's constantly receiving feedback as to how balanced it is. And so initially it doesn't know anything, right? It's just, it knows how to swing this thing and it's trying to figure out what, what's going on. And then as you, um, you know, go after, okay, after a few trials, right, it starts to learn how to like swing this thing. Okay, it doesn't know too well. 
yet, but it's starting to get a sense of things. Okay, I actually, let's fast forward to when it actually begins to balance this thing. Let's try 83. Okay, is it? Oh, it's getting close. There we go, now it's starting to balance the, balance the thing, right? So that's an autonomous system that's learning how to balance pull. <laughs> Okay, and this is, and as you can think, you can think about it. This is super important for robotics, right? Like this is a robotics problem. We have to teach robots to be able to balance themselves, right? They have to be able to stand. And and it's also it's worth noting again, like it doesn't know anything about physics. It doesn't know anything about gravity. It doesn't know. All it knows is like it receives a reward for the the pole have being upright, and so it learns like, oh, if I, you know. If I go left and right, it even learns how to play against the human adversary, which is trying to fool it, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so that's pretty neat. No, I didn't see that. Right. Uh, watching what? It's using a... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. What's it watching? Oh, really? Oh, interesting. Ah. I haven't seen that. No. That that sounds pretty neat. Yeah. Link. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. Let's see. We got twenty minutes. Okay. So now I'm going to lead up to the crowning achievement of 2016, which was the system that learned how to play. Go, the ancient game of the ancient game board game of Go, which is very difficult, um, and we're going to kind of lead up to it in the, in three steps. The first is we're going to describe how an AI would play tic tac toe, then we're going to describe how an AI would play chess, and then we will describe Go, uh, and we're going to learn a couple of new things, and then we'll see how some of the all of the featured things that we've learned in this class and the previous ones kind of leads us to making a system that plays Go effectively. Um, so tic-tac-toe, everyone that has played tic-tac-toe, right? You're all familiar with, you know, you have to draw the X's and the O's. Here, there, there's no X's and O's, they're just, they're using colored blocks. I just found this image online. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the way to think about tic-tac-toe, uh, or any board game, right? So tic-tac-toe, chess, and, and go are all board games where you, you know, place a piece or a symbol on a, on a particular cell in the board. And um, in a series of time steps. And so you can model it, in the case of tic-tac-toe, um, we can model it as like a tree, right? So you have like an initial root at the tree, which is an empty board, and then it can branch out into nine different actions where the first player, the X, is placed into one of the nine cells. So you have these nine, and then these nine branch out into eight more. Each of these branch out into, like here's a single one that branches out into eight different boards, which contain the next the yellow response, right, which is a, which is an O in the case of tic tac toe, and so it's this big sort of tree of game states, which describes every possible sequence that the game can be can take. Now, if you expand this out, it would be you know nine factorial. There'd be nine factorial possible uh, branches to this, so that's nine times eight times seven times six all the way down, right? So that's a really big number. But actually, um, remember that you can arrive at a particular game state. Uh, at, at a, in a variety of ways, like the 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 rule, the um, actions can be taken in different orders and so on, right? So there's actually, I think, 765 possible states of tic tac toe, and um, I guess it's in the, I want to say in the tens of thousands of unique paths to those games. I forget what the numbers are, but it's something like that. So that's a small enough number that we can solve tic-tac-toe by brute force, which means that um, if we're playing an AI, if we train an AI to play tic-tac-toe, we can simply s tell it to evaluate every possible position to learn what the good the, the move it should take is. And the way it would do that is, like suppose we're in the very second, we're in the last um, stage of the game where there's one move left, and it, and it can follow the tree down to the winning, winning route and the losing route. We just say to it, take the winning route, right? And then uh, if we're farther up the tree, the, the route that it wants to take will be the one that is most likely to lead to a victory. 
So to know that, it has to analyze the entire tree. It has to go to the ends of every game, every possible route it can take through this tree. And it will pick the one that has, um, of its you know, sub-trees, the highest percentage of them lead to victories. So that's a really simple way to, to, to beat tic-tac-toe, um, is that. right? So that's brute force, super simple, uh, and should make intuitive sense to everyone. Right? So just analyze every possible position. Um, that's tic-tac-toe, right? And we'll see that chess and go are arranged similarly, that you can imagine it as this sort of tree of possible routes to take. Um, but we're going to see that with both chess and go, we can't solve it by brute force. Okay, so what about too many chess? What about chess? Um, so with chess, the problem is there's way too many nodes to evaluate. The branching of chess games of different you know, um, positions that you can take. Chess is constrained in various ways, right? So like pieces can only move in various, um, it, pieces can, are limited by where they can move um, and, um, and various other limitations like that. Uh, but even still, the um, number of possible boards of chess is estimated to be, I think, 10 to the, uh, is on the order of 10 to the 120th power. That is an incredibly large number, right? That's a one with 120 zeros after it. That's more than the number of atoms in the universe. It's many orders of magnitude more than the number of atoms in the universe. So we can't do this by brute force. You know, we know that computers are fast, but they can't possibly evaluate every game state. Um, and so how do we deal with computer chess? Um, and this was, um, this was very famously done in uh, 1996, 97. And this is actually, for me, it's kind of a personal thing because this was like one of, for me, like as a kid, as a kid in, in, at this time, and I, was, and I was a big chess player too. This is my sort of Soviet heritage. Uh, I had like played chess with my grandparents and I was watching this and I was like, wow, a computer can beat the top player in chess. So maybe this was like an inspiring moment or something. How, how do, who remembers this? You were all old enough in the 90s, yeah. You all remember the 90s, yeah. So do you, you guys all remember Gary Kasparov and Deep Blue? Okay, cool. So this is, um, so basically Deep Blue lost in 96, so Kasparov was able to beat it. And, uh, but in 97, uh, I think Deep Blue won most of the games and maybe like lost once and drew a few. Uh, and, um, and so this was a big deal, right? We were like, wow, AI has beaten chess. Um, and there's kind of two, two important things to, uh, to understand about this, which will kind of diminish the victory a little bit. So I think it was still like a big deal, um, but it's not as big of a deal as Go, and I'll tell you why. Um, so the system that was built for Deep Blue, uh, number one, it's, it's actually not completely true that we solved chess at this time. So it turns out that like a lot of later commentary about it said that Kasparov like um, actually just didn't play correctly in the sense that he played it like another human being. He didn't really prepare for playing a computer, which is fundamentally playing in a different way from a human being. And um, later, cer certain like a, a number of players who were uh, also grandmasters, but not necessarily at the level of Kasparov, but who were interested in this, they began to uh, like try to understand different ways of beating computer games. And there's actually like I found the link um, of like one really funny game in particular against. Uh, one of the successors of Deep Blue called uh, Ribka, uh, which was a like a chess system that you know very advanced chess AI, and um, this the player demonstrated that you could like trick it in various ways by playing in very unorthodox ways, uh, and like, and so it turned out that for a number of years after, uh, they were uh, like chess computers were still not quite beating top human players if the human players were able to sufficiently prepare. Um, so I think by now chess is pretty much solved, um, but uh, maybe at this time it was sort of a false alarm. <laughs> um, but the other thing, the, the bigger reason why, um, why this is not quite as big news as Go is, um, I'll, I'll kind of lead up to it. Um, so um, how, does, how do we deal with this problem of not being able to evaluate all of the possible game states, right? So in the tree, uh, the most ob the thing that we have to do is we have to uh, forget parsing the entire tree and try to parse only some of it, and to try to look for promising moves and promising paths, and basically uh, like 
forget large parts of the tree and just just uh, discard them if we can figure out early enough that it's not worth I evaluating all these parts of the tree. Uh, so this is pruning the tree, right? And you can kind of prune it in two ways. You can prune the width of it, so you don't, like, at the front, whatever level you are, you're not going to evaluate every possible move you have there. You might evaluate some subset of promising moves. And that's what humans do, right? You don't evaluate every possible move uh, uh, mentally. You are able to know that a, a whole, like, 99% of moves don't make sense at all from just the first, you know, f at first glance. And so we have to endow a, a computer chess system to be able to make the same distinction so that it doesn't spend too much time uh, looking through moves which are not really promising. And so effectively that means that we have to um, uh, like be able to grade moves based on how promising they are in some sense. And then the ones that are most promising, we can, we can evaluate their trees. So that's the sort of limiting the breadth of the search tree. And then limiting the depth is another thing that we have to do. So the way that with tic-tac-toe to evaluate a particular, like let's say we're looking at with chess, like one branch of this tree, this branch has been scored the following, right? Negative 3.0. What does this mean? This means that every sub-branch coming out of this, like whatever this game state is, all of the branches have been summarized with this one score that says, this, this state right here has this particular score that's a summary of how good it is looking at all the branches that, all of the possible branches that go out from a, out under it. So this is really, uh, with tic-tac-toe, it's very explicit. We can just count the probability of the victory. So count the number of victories at, at the child nodes, the, like the very bottom, the leaves. You just count up the victories and divide by the total number and then you have a score. But we can't do this with chess anymore unless we evaluate absolute every single branch. So that's impossible, as we have alluded to. Um, and, um, and so we have to be able to kind of like take an arbitrary board and score it. And so the way they did this with Deep Blue is that... Oh, let, me, let me... I'll get into that in a second. The way they did that with Deep Blue is that they... Um, uh, they created this like expert scoring function, which would look at a board at a particular, you know, any particular board state and score how good it is for, for one of the players. And um, this, it turns out, they spent a really large amount of time handcrafting this function. So it, it, like, you can imagine a few naive ways of doing it, right? You can like count up the number of pieces that, if you're white, let's say, and you want to evaluate how good it is for white, you can count up the number of pieces you have versus the number of pieces your opponent has. You can count up like, maybe a little more sophisticated, like you can count up how many uh, like of the squares are in check from your pieces, or you can count like, um, you know, little things like that, basically heuristics for chess heuristics, like how good is my position. Um, and the function that, that Deep Blue, that, the, that IBM came up with, was this really crazy long, extremely expert crafted, you know, with the help of grandmasters, um, that had like, I think, 8,000 components to it or something. So it was a really, really crazy scoring function. Uh, and, um, and so the way they would, they would eliminate the... Um, they, they, okay, so they would use this in tandem with a search algorithm, which I'm going to get into, uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and it works like this. Okay, so all of these... So when you don't have... When you have to parse a tree, and you, can, and you know you can't parse the entire thing, you can use something called Monte Carlo Tree Search. Monte Carlo Tree Search is an algorithm for parsing through a tree from a root to its various nodes, uh, which is stochastic, so there's, um, it has some randomness to it. Um, you, you'll see there's a whole class of like algorithms and statistics that are called like Monte Carlo, like Monte Carlo sampling algorithms and so on. These are all like stochastic uh, methods for, for simulating basically going through simulations of things. So here we have to simulate going through this, the, the, the tree of like um, chess simulations, right? But you know you can't do it for all of them. And so what you do is you do this, and I'm gonna describe it very like sort of briefly. There's a, a method which is constantly like kind of randomly parsing different uh, parts of the tree. And some of them it goes to the end, you know, so it might, have, it might simulate an entire game 
you know, going through some path through this crazy, you know, chess game space. Uh, and then we'll count up wins. And as it does, it for every node, it keeps a sort of running score for it, which is related to how much, how good its sub-branches are. And it's constantly updating these scores as it acquires more information about the tree. And um, it uses these scores through, uh, it uses these scores in order to make decisions about which parts of the tree to, uh, to actually sample and which parts to discard. So if we find out early on that some of these branches, they, they tend, like some of the simulations that went through them gave us losses and too many of them, it'll, it'll go, you know what, I'm not going to evaluate any more of the sub-branches from this node. We know that it's not that good anymore. We'll leave it be and we'll, we'll look for more promising branches. And the more promising branches are the ones that, that have a higher mm -hmm. score at them coming through. And we actually, the crazy thing is that the way that these are, the way that we determine these sort of probabilities for sampling is accomplished through backpropagation, which is the same way that we train neural networks. So it's sort of like, um, which we haven't talked about enough to really describe the parallels between them, but, but it's kind of worth knowing that like there's a lot of commonalities between these things. Anyway, um, so there's this stochastic process, which is, and it works very similar to our minds, right? So like you will, you might evaluate some position for a couple of minutes and then determine like, okay, this is not promising. Let me go to some other part of the tree. Um, and that's what Monte Carlo tree search does. Um, one thing that's important to know about Monte Carlo tree search is this, um, and this is actually intrinsic to the stuff we were talking about with the Atari games too. There's a, in, the, in reinforcement learning, um, there's this notion of like a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, which is very um, explicit in, in the example of Monte Carlo. So suppose uh, um, and, and the trade-off is, do we uh, explore more states that we don't know about to try to find out you know, more promising routes? Or do we go down this promising route and figure out, you know, do we exploit it basically? Once we find out there's some state that's pretty good, do we exploit it or do we try to explore other ones? And this is like a really good, um, this is very, this is used in machine learning classes very often to describe this problem is um, something called the, um, uh, what is it? Many arm, multi-arm bandit. So the, it's a thought, it's a thought experiment that goes like this. Suppose you're in the casino and there's like a bunch of slot machines and you can play any of them. And all of them are really simple. They just give you a win some percentage of the time and a loss some other percentage of the time. So some of them have a high percentage, and so they win a lot. Others have a low percentage, and so they don't win a lot. And we, but we don't know them in advance. So the question is, how do you design an agent which is going to maximize the amount of wins uh, by repeatedly playing these machines? So it has to explore to some degree. It has to try out these different slot machines to figure out which ones are giving high, tend to give high rewards, right? And let's say it finds one that's like gives it 70% of the time it wins. So exploitation would be like, it goes, oh, 70%, that's pretty good. I'm going to start just, you know, hammering on this one. Uh, but then explore, exploration would be like, well, maybe one of these slot machines is actually 80%. So maybe I'm going to try to find one. So this is kind of the, the notion of like exploration versus exploitation. And with Monte Carlo tree search, it's really important where we can, we can like, we have to constantly decide like, should we evaluate new parts of the tree that we haven't looked at before or should we... Um, exploit, uh, exploit this one further. Oh, it's, uh, there's two minutes left. You guys give me five minutes? We're going to talk about AlphaGo. You can't leave for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're almost there. Um, so this is kind of what happens when you expand Monte Carlo. And this is kind of like basically what Deep Blue is kind of like in action. So it's constantly, and this is, this is like what a Monte Carlo tree search looks like. So you see it's constantly uh, adding nodes to the game as it finds, as it, as it evaluates new ones, and it basically just like prunes the tree and it's, it, it just um, goes down promising paths. And then it selects a move, uh, like the move that it has to take is one of these, right? And it will select one that is the most promising based on the search that it's done so far. And this is basically how Deep Blue works. It is a um, Monte Carlo tree search where the evaluation at every node here, at every leaf node, the evaluation it does is that handcrafted 8,000 part function that, that IBM designed to evaluate chess positions. And that's Deep Blue in a nutshell, okay? 
Um, Go. Let's get into Go. So why, um, why AlphaGo is so much more interesting than Deep Blue is because they do not have this expert function. So um, much like these, and it's actually it's made by the same people, DeepMind, um, it, uh, it doesn't encode any knowledge of the game of Go into uh, the system. It's not, uh, like there's no expert function that evaluates Go positions, nothing like that. Um, you'll see that they take a different approach to it. It's similar, but a different approach to it that doesn't involve any expert guidance. And that's really important because, as we saw with the Atari games, that suggests that this is potentially a more uh, generalizable uh, system that we can apply to different things. And we see that Deep Blue, like, basically after it did, it solved chess, it didn't do anything else after that. Like, they, you know, they retired it. I mean, some of that knowledge was able to transfer into other domains, but the system that they had built, most of the work really went into that 8,000 function um, system that they use for evaluating chess positions. And here we don't have any of that. So, uh, first of all, everyone familiar with this? This was last month. Uh, okay, so some people don't know about this. So let me just describe. So Go is this board game. Um, it's very much like chess. It's a strategy game. And um, it's not super popular in the West. It's, it's much more popular in East Asia. So in, like, it's, it's played by a, a lot of people in, in China, Korea, and Japan in particular. Um, and uh, it's another strategy board game. And the rules are like this. And I'm going to describe the, the rules are actually incredibly simple. Uh, the, you have a 19 by 19 grid. You, there's two players, black and white, and they take turns placing stones on the grid. And um, once they put the stone on, it never leaves. So you just put a stone on, and that's the position, right? And the board fills up progressively. And the way you get points is by encircling your opponent's stones with your stones. So if you're the black player, you're trying to encircle uh, like your opponent's stones with your your own. So for example, like um, right over uh, like just trying to. I'm not. I'm not actually a go player myself, so I'm not. Left top will be like. Huh. Left top. Oh, left top. Yeah, actually, right here, and also um, encircling just empty board spaces. So you. So black will get points for this part of the board, and um, I guess it won't. I'm not good at reading good words, but basically you're trying to insert, the rules are actually not important for us right now, so. <laughs> um, but um, the game is super complex because of the following properties. So, uh, and I, I, I figured this out yesterday, and I think I might be wrong in some of the math. So tic-tac-toe boards, we said there's 765. Um, chess boards, there's 10 to the 120th, which we said is more than the number of atoms in the universe, and more than the number of playing times since the Big Bang. So plank time is the amount of time it takes for a beam of light to uh, traverse a plank length, which is the smallest unit of matter possible. So it's a really small amount of time. It's like 10 to the negative 44th. And it's supposedly potentially like, in like it's the quanta of time. It's like the smallest unit of time you can possibly have. So if you multiply the number of plank times that have elapsed since the Big Bang times the number of atoms in the universe, you get an insanely large number which is orders of magnitude smaller than the number of possible Go boards there is. So that just describes the complexity of Go for you, which is, is really crazy. Okay, so I'm going to do this in, in five, and in, in we'll be done before six. That's okay. <laughs> so this is how Go works, uh, AlphaGo works. Um, is it combines Monte Carlo tree search, which we saw, which we need to do to evaluate the, the set of possible tree, uh, like set of possible games that we can go to evaluate possible moves. And it combines it with, with reinforcement learning uh, and convolutional neural networks. So there are two kinds of covenants that, are, that it makes. One is called a policy network and one is called a value network. The policy network is a convolutional neural network which was trained to predict the next move made by an expert, uh, made by a Go player. So they gave it like, like uh, tens of thousands of Go games, matches of Go played by experts, and it gave them all the moves, and it was trained in the following way. This is exactly like CubNet. It takes an input, which is a board. It's an image, right? It's a 19 by 19 black and white image, which becomes the input of our convolutional neural network. And the output is a one-hot vector. Remember, one-hot means that it's all zeros except the one for the piece that was placed. So this is the input. This is the output. And we have millions of examples of this happening from expert games. And so it learns to predict the next move in, uh, made by experts in Go games. 
And amazingly, uh, the amazing thing is that it's able to do, I think they said 57% uh, of the time it's able to effectively predict the next move made by an expert. That's really crazy, considering how many options there are, right? Um, that it's able to predict the next move without any knowledge of the game at all. It's just It's just an image problem to it. It predicts the next move. Um, and by itself, this thing can play Go. The, the, the policy network by itself is an effective amateur Go player. And it's not able to beat really good Go players, but it's able to play at an amateur level. So by itself, that's the policy network. The value network is, um, is a, also a convolutional neural network which, eva which evaluates how good a position is uh, by in the following way. And this is, this is where things get really crazy. Uh, so what they did was, so the, the, the value network takes an, an image of a Go board and it describes it, it, it says how good is this Go board, the value of it to the player. And, and um, again, it's also, it's a, it's a regression problem now. The image is the Go board and we're trying to predict how good it is. And, and um, it can do this by analyzing, when it has enough time, it can go and see how much of this, many times this particular board went to a victory. And what they do, and this is, this is crazy, I think. I think it's crazy. So they uh, train, they actually, uh, once they have an initial uh, policy network and a value network, they can actually improve the value network by making the system play itself. So it's, it's con they train these, uh, these um, the, the value network and the policy network, and they make two copies of it, and they start to play against each other. And then it's able to, from this, accrue a ton of data, which says, did this go state lead to a victory? And they do this for like many, many iterations, like millions of games. It plays against itself and it improves the value network in this way. So this is a form of reinforcement learning, right? It has the system play itself and it becomes better at it. So once you have the policy network um, and the value network, we can combine that with a Monte Carlo tree search to play go in the following way. Um, you... Uh, in the same way as chess, except the value network replaces that function that we use to, to say how good the chess position is, and the policy network tries to give us promising moves. So it's able to say, like, okay, this is what I think the next move might be, or what an expert, you know, an, the policy network is able to tell us, okay, an expert might make this move next, and so let's try a whole bunch of them, and it'll expand the tree using a Monte Carlo tree search, and it'll evaluate each of the nodes using the value network and then it will pick the best one, basically, and it will make that move. And uh, using this method, it was able to um, uh, beat Lisa Dahl, who's the best, uh, regarded by many as the best uh, player in the world at Go, uh, possibly in history. Or actually, I guess he's like, they say he's number two now, but he's the best player because number one is, is some player in China. Lisa Dahl's from, Korea, from uh, South Korea, uh, and the match was played in South Korea. Uh, just last month. So yeah, for those of you who missed the news, this was a big series last month in South Korea that Alpha um, Alpha Go played against Lee Sedol, who's described as you know he's the most decorated champion in the history of Go, uh, and it beat him four games to one. Lee was able managed to beat Alpha Go on one occasion, which is really uh, really inspired the human race. So we can still compete with Go, uh, maybe for now, uh, but things are getting much more difficult. Um, so that was it, um, and that was AlphaGo, and now we've moved on to more. And it turns out that it gets way harder. So now, if you try now thinking about this, like what if we want to play Doom, right? So uh, it turns out that this is actually way harder than Go, if you could believe it. And the reason is, this is like a video game that we've seen, but now this video game is way more complicated than the Atari games because the reward signal is very, very delayed, right? So like we're trying to... Now we have a very long sequence of actions that leads to reward, which is us passing the level. And there's way more input pixels. And there's this whole geometry where like, you don't see the whole game. You don't see everything at once. You like turn around and you get pixels coming from a different position. So um, it turns out that like more complex video games, they start to get really, really hard. Um, so that's video games. That's reinforcement learning. And that's uh, basically the material for the class. Um, so let me get out of the slides, and I'll just wrap up by saying um, next week we're doing presentations. So, um, and like I said, like should be very relaxed. It's just an opportunity to start a conversation about some of the works that you're that you've started, you know, thinking about. And um, you may or may not have some prototypes. Hopefully, um, you guys ha do have some prototypes. 
And you don't, you know, you can talk for as little as or, or as long as you want, or not as long as you want, because everyone has to go. Um, but if you are interested in these sessions that will have an SFPC, you can. That's a that's an opportunity to say that like next week you can maybe have a half. You know, you might not be fully done, but you'll have time to develop it over a couple of weeks if it so interests you. And then that can be used. You can actually like that'll be an opportunity to put something into the show, which uh, I'm hoping all of you do. Well, not all of you. I'm sure that that'll be difficult to arrange, but um, hoping that as many of you as possible participate. And um, I guess that's about all. Are there any questions about any of the material that we've seen today? Not so much. Okay. I'm going to email you guys uh, a Google poll about about the trying to arrange these sessions. Again, they're they're totally optional, but uh, hopefully a few of you will want to come by. And uh, otherwise, um, yeah, that's all. So, um, see you next week. Yeah.